Mr. Martin dismissed all of this with an effort. It had been annoying. It had driven him near to distraction, but he was too solid a man to be moved to murder by anything so childish. It was fortunate. He reflected as he passed on the important changes against Miss, Miss Barrows that he had stood up under it so well. He had maintained always an outward appearance of polite tolerance. Why, I even believe you like the woman, Miss mm -hmm. Paired. Sorry. Second page. Miss Paired, his other assistant, had once said to him, he had simply smiled. So he's so good at, at, at hiding this disdain that he has for this woman that people actually think, oh, well, you're just being cordial or, or maybe you really do like her, you know? So he, he's really good at hiding his disdain for her. He really just does not like her. But no one can tell because he's Mr. Cool. He's Mr. Martin. He's like on it. He sees every angle. Okay. So a gavel wrapped in Mr. Martin's mind and the case proper was resumed. Miss Yule Jean Barrows stood charged with willful, blatant, and persistent attempts to destroy the efficiency and systems of FNS. Stop. This is cool because it's like a metaphor in his head. It's like he's, he's putting her on trial in his brain. And yeah, she has these things, her voice is queered, and she laughs loud, and she has these weird sayings, but this is why he really wants to get rid of her. This is why he wants to rub her out, because of the things that she's doing at FNS, which is the place that he works. She, it says, um, it was competent material and relevant to review her advent and rise to power. Okay, so first of all, the very first thing he's going to call her out on is how she got to be the number two in charge. Mr. Martin had got the story from Miss Paird, who seemed always able to find things out. According to her, Miss Barrows had met Mr. Fitweiler at a party where she had rescued him from the embraces of a powerfully built drunken man who had mistaken the president of FNS for a famous retired Middle, Middle Western football coach. She had led him to a sofa and somehow worked upon him a monstrous magic. Stop. This is to imply that Mr. Martin thinks that Miss Barrows got to be the number two position by flirting with the president. Now, it doesn't say anything as, as uh, in your face as like messing around with them or going to bed with them or anything like that. But the fact that she's using the fact that she's a woman to move up in the company and to be the number two, Mr. Martin's not about that. He even goes as far as to call it a monstrous magic. Uh, picking up right there, it says, the aging gentleman had jumped to the conclusion that there and then that this was a woman of singular attainments, equipped to bring out the best in him and in the firm. A week later, he had introduced her into the FNS as his special advisor. Notice that it's a week after he meets her that she becomes the special advisor. And this is what Mr. Martin has a problem with. He's like, no, 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 no. What you're going to find out is Mr. Martin's been with the company for a very long time. On that day, confusion got its foot in the door. After Miss Tyson, Mr. Mr. Bundage, and Mr. Bartlett had been fired, and Miss, Mr. Munson had taken his hat and stalked out, mailing in his resignation letter, old Roberts had been in, uh, emboldened to speak to Mr. Fitweiler. Okay, stop. So what this means is that this lady comes in, and she starts whispering into the president's ears, and suddenly Mr. Tyson, Mr. Bundage, and Mr. Bartlett are all gone. And then this guy, Mr. Munson storms out like he's not happy with the decisions that are being made chances are she's in mr fitweiler the president his ear and telling him hey you need to get rid of these people he mentioned that mr munson's department had been a little disrupted and hadn't there perhaps better resumed the old system there mr fitweiler had said certainly not he had the greatest faith in miss barrow's ideas they require a little seasoning a little seasoning is all he had added. Mr. Roberts had given it up. Mr. Martin reviewed in detail all the changes wrought by Miss Barrows. She had begun chipping at the cornices of the firm's edifice, and now she was swinging at the foundation stones with a pickaxe. Stop. He's, again, using another metaphor. It's like, um, it's like if somebody came into the classroom and was a teaching assistant, and they didn't earn the right to be there, but suddenly they started changing things and making everything different. That would be like if somebody came in uh, into fur and became an AP and they didn't have the right to be there. They don't know anything about our kids. They don't know anything about the system that we go through. They don't know about all the stuff that we do 
here day in, day out. And then they start making changes. And then they fire some Deas, and they fire Simmons, and they fire Horn, and they fire Adams, and they fire all these teachers. But they don't know about what's going on, right? But because Dr. Simmons likes this person so much, when people say, hey, Doc Simmons, this person is messing everything up, Doc Simmons is like, hey, we just got to trust her because I really think that, or he or she, that everything is going to be okay. That's what's going on here. And I love the fact that he says she had begun chipping at the cornices of the firm's edifice. Like an edifice is like uh, the front of a building where it looks beautiful and it has statues and stuff. And, and, you know, if you're chipping at the edifice, you're just making cosmetic changes. But now this lady is starting to swing at the foundation with a pickaxe. Like she's really going to break the whole system down just to rebuild it in the way that she thinks it should be rebuilt. So, of course, Mr. Martin... Our man, Mr. Martin, who's Mr. Cool, Mr. Sees Everything Coming, he has to know that something eventually is going to come his way. I mean, she's always giving him a hard time. So he's got to know something's coming his way. And I think that that's what's really pushing him to think, hey, I got to get rid of her. I got to rub her out. <clears throat> Mr. Martin came now in his summing up to the afternoon on Monday, November 2nd, 1942. Just one week ago. On that day at 3 p.m., Miss Barrows had bounced into his office. Boo! She had yelled. Are you scraping around the bottom of the pickle barrel? Mr. Martin had looked at her from under his, uh, his green eye shade, saying nothing. She had begun to wonder about the office, taking it in with her great popping eyes. Do you really need all these filing cabinets? She had demanded suddenly. Mr. Martin's heart had jumped. Each of these files... He had said, keeping his voice even, plays an indispensable part in the system of FNS. She had brayed at him. Well, don't tear up any of the pea patch and gone to the door. From there, she had bawled. But you sure have got a lot of fine scrap in here. Mr. Martin could no longer doubt that the finger was on his beloved department. Her, pick, her pickaxe was on the upswing, poised for the first blow. It had not come yet. He had received no blue memo from the enchanted Mr. Fitweller, bearing nonsensical instructions delivering from this obscene woman. But there was no doubt in Mr. Martin's mind that one would be forthcoming. He must act quickly. Already a precious week had gone by. Mr. Martin stood up in his living room, still holding his milk glass. Gentlemen of the jury, he said to himself, I demand a death penalty for this horrible person. Stop. He sees the writing on the wall. If you don't know that expression, that means he sees what's coming. She's already gotten rid of one department. Then she comes nosing around his department and looking at everything and asking questions. He knows that she's going to get rid of him or his department and try to find a different way to do things. So this is when he decides she's got to go. And he says, I demand the death penalty for this horrible person. So now things are going to get interesting. Remember, Mr. Martin is a person who doesn't miscalculate things. He's a person who thinks about the things that he's going to do. And if his will is to get rid of this person, to kill her, it's going to happen. All right. So the next day, Mr. Martin followed his routine as usual. He polished his glasses more often and once sharpened an already sharpened pencil, but not even Miss Paird noticed. Only once did he catch sight of his victim. She swept past him in the hall with a patronizing, Hi! At fifth. Oh, sorry. At 5.30, he walked home, as usual, and had a glass of milk, as usual. He had never drunk anything stronger in his life, unless you could count ginger ale. The late Sam Schulschler of the S in FNS had praised Mr. Martin at a staff meeting several years before for his temperate habits. Our most efficient worker neither drinks nor smokes, he had said. The result speaks for themselves. Mr. Fettweiler had sat by, nodding approval. Okay. So even the guys who run the company know that Mr. Martin is a good guy. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. And this is important because it's mentioned at least three times already. All right? But this is important because this is about character. As I've told you, Mr. Martin is a straight arrow. He does everything by the book. He sees all the angles. He sees everything calculated. So watch. <clears throat> 